Welcome to the Spiritual Leadership Podcast with Pastor Paul Chapel, pastor of Lancaster Baptist Church and founder and president of West Coast Baptist College. Well, welcome to another episode of the Spiritual Leadership Podcast. My name is Larry Chapel, and I'm here with my dad, Pastor Chapel, and we did not plan to wear matching outfits today. No, we're looking we're looking good though. We're looking pretty good, but that's just the way it worked out. Yeah, we're yeah. not going to sing a song or anything like that. No, not today. <laughs> but we do have a good discussion uh, prepared for today, and uh, the topic that you've chosen for discussion is leading through times of delusion. And I just wanted to start with, uh, I want to give you an opportunity to give us a frame of reference for, for what that word means and why you've chosen it for this discussion. Well, the word delusion is a Bible term. And, you know, Larry, so oftentimes uh, in the ministry, we see the fruit pro of the problem, but there's a root as well. And right now we see a lot of hurt, a lot of division, a lot of hate. Um, we see a lot in the way of uh, political upheaval. Um, and emotions. But when you get into the scriptures, you find that there's, there are some root issues there. And one of the Bible words that speaks to it is the word delusion. And it's interesting to me because uh, we're, we know that we're going to see a day of delusion coming. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, speaking of the Antichrist, verse uh, number 11, for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And it's talking about the fact that the world is running after Satan. He's, they're running after uh, wrong philosophies. And so they come under this delusion. I get the sense personally that there's a conditioning happening right now through the COVID response and the uh, way that we have so quickly uh, had to change from our service schedules and these different things, the government's role in the church. Also, with respect to a lot of the society's ills, there's a conditioning for the coming of a one world leader. And so the delusion is something that is already beginning to affect the minds of people. Uh, in Romans, it's also mentioned in chapter one, uh, when it says concerning the early Gentile world, verse 28, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And when we see the anarchists, when we see the combining together of, of good causes, like people that want uh, civil rights and justice, but also being combined with uh, same-sex marriage and being combined with anarchists, uh, we begin to realize there's, there's something deeper than just the fruit. There's some spiritually rooted problems that we as spiritual leaders have to help people sort through. Mm, that's really good. So that kind of gives us the framework for where we're going to go forward. It seems like with this delusion, this chaos, this confusion, this spiritual darkness that's happening right now, um, it's a listening response uh, just from just about everyone. And it seems like there's there's been some good responses. Uh, there's been some bad responses or some negative responses. And it seems like there's been plenty of empty responses, right. uh, virtue signaling or saying something to appease the moment, but not actually address the issue. Right. And so what we're going to do today is, and you shared some of these, you've come up with a list of some responses, some tangible things that as Christian leaders we can be doing. And so I love this list. We're going to go through them. The first thing that you, you uh, put on this list was prayer. So would you speak to that for just a moment? Well, uh, in Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah is talking in chapter four about the uh, encroaching of Sanballat and Tobiah and how they were coming against him and setting soldiers against Jerusalem. And so he says, so we went to our God in prayer. And I think the church has got to get back to praying. Um, you see, a delusion speaks also to spiritual warfare. Uh, the psychological warfare that comes with that. Satan wants to have these imaginations in our mind and these worries in our mind. The only way to cast down those imaginations really is through the Word of God and prayer. And so if we're going to see clearly as leaders through the headlines, through the emotions, we've got to get back to prayer. And I'm just burdened about that. You know, as a pastor, a lot of my ability to plan is hindered right now because of COVID. A lot of my ability to communicate, the way I like to communicate is hindered as far as personal preaching and such. Uh, but the most important way to communicate is prayer and that's never hindered. I love this next one because I feel like it goes hand in hand because Jesus, when he prayed, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Right. And, uh, and so the next thing you mentioned was just the sovereignty of God, just trusting 
God in this moment. Yeah, you know, Larry, uh, a couple days ago, I was with Dr. Sisk, and and uh, just as I did in my late 20s and early 30s, I took a yellow notepad, and I just had questions for him about what's going on in the world and and uh, and how to respond. And we both discussed the sovereignty of God, resting in the sovereignty of God. And one of the things that I've tried to say over the years is that God is not as interested in assigning blame as he is in resolving the problems. And so, again, society is casting blame, you know, uh, government to people, people to government, race to race, police to this one. And everyone's got their opinion. God is not as interested in assigning blame and as he is in solving the problem. Now, I understand to an extent uh, there needs to be um, a humility and a repentance and sometimes acknowledging that I'm the one that was wrong. I get that. But the purpose is not just to say you're wrong. The purpose is to see God resolve the matter. And when we trust in his sovereignty, we're one step further to seeing God resolve the matter because we all are entering in as Christians saying, God's at work, he's working, he's gonna work through COVID, he's gonna work through all these difficult times. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son and God's right on schedule. So as we enter this time of delusion, we don't wanna lose heart. We wanna know God's still working. Also, it shouldn't surprise us as believers, too, because the Bible tells us that things aren't going to get better and better. Well, and, and Larry, I have to tell, you know, I, I have to tell myself that and remind myself that because um, we want to plan and, and we want to promote. We want to go forward. Um, but God's in control. I mean, man proposes, God disposes. And so when you think of sovereignty, you really think of, yes, do your best. But just remember, God's still in control. Uh, the next thing you wrote, and I think this is great because this is taking a negative situation and uh, having a positive reality from it. Uh, you wrote down something to the effect of learn through difficulties. Right. Could you speak to that? Well, I think we need to take this time that we're in, this time of uh, psychological warfare, spiritual delusion, angst, um, a time when suicides are up and uh, authority is not trusted. And, and all of this should be a teaching time for us. And I think in every situation we can learn how to do better. It might be how we see public officials relating to people, um, how we uh, see uh, perhaps uh, transgressions not being dealt with with humility. Whatever, you can learn. And I think all of us need to take time to say, what can I do? Uh, Psalm 119.71 says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn from my statutes. So you really think about that. You know, God says, I want to teach you during this pain. I don't want you to waste this trial. And someone said there's three times when we experience a spiritual breakthrough. Uh, first, when we hurt enough that we have to change. Secondly, when we learn enough that we want to change. And thirdly, when we receive enough that we're able to change. Now, I'm going to repeat that real quickly first. We, we, we will experience change in our lives when we're hurting enough that we have to change. So right now, all of our churches are in a time of incredible discomfort, but God's gonna move us and change us in ways that he has ordained. Secondly, when we learn enough, uh, one of the challenges that we face as fundamentalists, so to speak, is that we can be so uh, set in our ways. Now, we wanna be set in fundamental doctrine, but uh, God wants us to be a flexible church and a pliable church to be able to learn and to adapt, uh, whether it's online technologies or service schedules. All of us are going to have to flex right now. So we've got to learn enough to want to, and then we have to receive enough to be able to change. So I'm just saying difficulty is a time to ad adjust and learn if we'll let God do that. That's great. And that's something that you just got to be patient with and learn and pray for wisdom. And you don't instantly have that. No, no. And I think in the next couple of months, uh, I'm going to teach a lesson uh, here on the podcast, even things I learned during COVID-19. I've got seven or eight going, some things the Lord changed in my life. Uh, but all of us need to be journaling what we're learning right now. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's so important, too, for leaders, because I think the... Uh, the initial response is, well, I got to step out and lead. I got to say something. I got to do something. But if you're not learning, if you're not right. growing, right. where are you going to lead from? And I love that point. Um, you, the next thing you wrote down was something along the lines of don't retaliate. Right. And I think that's such a great thought. Would you speak to that? 
Somehow, in the midst of delusionary times, there develops a sense of anger towards all authority. And, you know, there's a lot of theories. Uh, I read an article the other day by Newt Gingrich on how Marxism crept into the public educational system. And he was an educator before he got into Congress. And the idea of fomenting anger towards authority was something used in the communist rallies. Well, this anarchist spirit is one extreme, but the whole idea of question authority, that, that goes back to the 60s and it's grown in our society. And in the midst of that, you know, what I have found is sometimes the hate mail will increase, the angst against leaders that are any kind of traditional like us, uh, who believe the Bible, uh, you're just gonna, you're gonna have some people lash out at you because you're a Bible-believing Christian leader. Um, and I mean, we're really, you know, somewhat in the moral minority today. And, and, you know, you think about, you know, we believe in marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, we believe that, uh, you know, that God is a holy God. And, and even in us personally, we like to hunt. I mean, we're weird people compared to a lot of those that, you know, would look at us and, and say that. So so they're going to have an opinion about our, our uh, beliefs and practices, either spiritually or personally. And so what I would what I would say here to our, our friends is don't get into a situation where every time you're criticized, you retaliate. I mean, one of the worst mistakes pastors make is to take one or two letters and go to the pulpit with it, you know, and, and try to defend themselves. And you, I've heard you say uh, so many times before, you can have the right position, the wrong disposition. That's right. And I, I think that's something that we've seen uh, even the last few months. Uh, guys that had the right, they were right positionally, uh, but their disposition, their demeanor was not yeah. not uh, of Christian love. And, and I look at, I talked to a pastor this morning and I mean, he was pretty frustrated about just lots of issues. This may be one of the most stressful periods of time I've ever seen in the ministry. And it's easy to let it build, 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 build. And, then, and, you, and really a lot of us like this summer can't even take what we would consider a normal vacation, at least in my life. I'm gonna pretty much be around here all summer. Uh, because of the, the need of the church. And I'll take some time here and there during the week. But the point is that um, there's a lot of angst and, and it's frustrating, but you don't want to show that. You, you, not, you need to get with the Lord in prayer. Give it to the Lord. And, and remember this, most members of your church will make about as big a deal of things as you do. So if, if they're getting frustrated by the news and then they come to church and you're making a big deal about it, it exasperates it. So don't retaliate. Don't stir up the pot, but just remember that we're to be moderate. We're to let our moderation be known, and that word means sweet peaceableness. So These are all great thoughts. What's the next thing uh, that you think we can do practically and tangibly during a time such as this? Well, I, I would say this is a general thought, but I wanted to mention briefly, we need to grow in grace. And it ties in with what we were just saying, you know, grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, because grace is the inner disposition of the Holy Spirit that gives us the peace and the joy that we need. And, you, you know, I, I've been in the ministry here. I've been just celebrated 34 years in this one church. There's times when I had that sweet peaceableness. There's been other times when I've been edgy and tired. And I just would like to say to a lot of our pastor friends, just take some time, take a couple days off, you know, call another pastor, but get along with God and, and grow in the grace of God this summer. Hmm. Uh, the next thing you wrote down was to love your family. You know, um, I thank the Lord for our family. I thank the Lord for you, Larry. Um, I thank God for mom. Uh, and this summer and this COVID time, this spring, this summer, uh, we have longed to be with our church family and we've starting to have some times for that. But I'm gonna tell you what, at the end of the day, um, we need to cherish the family that God's given us and, uh, and minister to our family. And, and just remember, that's why uh, when these harsh times come, we need to be taking time all up to these times and during these times to thank the Lord for the family unit. Uh, because a lot of the, a lot of the tragedies we're seeing in society are because of the breakdown of the family. And, uh, pastors need to take good care, uh, investing in their family and enjoying their family. That, that's something the Lord's been teaching me because in the last <clears throat> few weeks, uh, the, the news cycle has been so heavy. Yeah. And you get, you hop on social media and you see, uh, you know, people, maybe acquaintances, you know, or uh, take uh, harsh positions that you would disagree with. And those can weigh heavy on you. 
And, and, and good people take different positions. Right. Like in, in, in our church and in every church, you've got people that are like, we shouldn't go back to church until the word COVID is erased from the dictionary. And then you've got those that think you're compromising if you're not having three services. And here you are in the middle. And, and, and thank God when you can go home and you have a wife and, and children or grandchildren that still loves you. But you have to do that. You have to stop and thank God for that. Because I know there have been times where I've been home surrounded by kids that can't get enough of me and my mind has been preoccupied by something that right. rubbed me the wrong way. So this is a good point, just to be yeah. thankful for those in your life that love you <laughs> unconditionally right. and are, are gonna be there 10, 15, 20 years from now. You know, um, this morning uh, I was doing our, our little prayer time online at home that we've been doing and uh, two of our grandsons were there, Chandler and Camden, and, and Chandler said something I don't think I'll ever forget. He came up to me, he said, Papa, Today, I'm not gonna watch news. Maybe we could just take a walk. Yeah. And it showed me that the news has gotten heavy on his seven-year-old mind. I, I've thought of sitting my girls down for an interview, just even if it's for my own amusement, uh, to see COVID and this time through the eyes of children. Because my girls are uh, four and seven and they know the word, they know the word quarantine. and. Right. Uh, just to see this through their eyes too would be interesting. So, you know, this time has shown to us why we need to minister to our family and find solace in our family. And that's that's what I would say to our pastor friends is keep your family relations strong during this time. Hmm. Um, you mentioned uh, assessment. Yeah, I, I like to take times like this to make assessments and uh, and to step back. This is a time when we can ask questions like, Lord, how can I handle this better? Or how could I have done this better? And of course, we're assessing the delusionary tactics of Satan and we're asking, how can I help our people? As you know, Larry, two weeks ago, I brought an entire full-length message on the subject of racism and, uh, and, and delved into the scriptures. And, and, and that was done after a lot of prayerful assessment and not only the topic, but the timing. And, and I think it was helpful to our church. Um, and, and I really believe that you know, we need to assess, uh, there's a lot of false guilt going on and people trying to guilt people into doing things. So you don't wanna do something based on everyone else's assessment, but you and God have to come to terms with how your ministry should respond to whatever issues are going on, whether it's COVID and the scheduling of church, whether it's the race uh, uh, relations issues and letting the position of the Bible be known or whether it's just your schedule as a pastor, but this is a good time to assess and to make changes for the upcoming seasons of ministry. Mm, that's good. What else do you have? Well, I, I think another, uh, another situation that I think is important during this time is just to develop the leaders around you. Um, and I, I really believe as we're going through this, this is gut-wrenching. It causes us to, as I said a moment ago, assess, change, love our families, all these things. So then share that with your staff and talk to them about why you're changing the schedule, why you gave this sermon. Um, this week I was given an excerpt from a message that I sent to you and it was just a terrible uh, interpretation of scripture uh, by a teacher who was trying to explain something but really misinterpreted the passage. And kind of for a test, I sent that out to 40 guys that work on our staff here and said, listen to this three or four minutes and give me your feedback, which you did it yesterday. You were the first one to come back and, and you said, this is performanceism or this isn't Christ-centered or whatever. But that, uh, that became a teaching moment, uh, just that little isolated incident. And I think as leaders, we need to be bringing our teams along with us, sharing uh, the articles that we're reading, the reasons why. Uh, and so I would encourage you as a leader don't travel alone, but share what you're learning. And, and as you know, Larry, a lot of the guys that are on a staff like this, they want to know what the leader's growing through. I even think that extends to our church family. And right before we press record, you were, you were, we were talking through a situation and you said, I wish I miss Sunday nights or your visit with the pastor yeah. where you could, because right now our church family, they're getting the bullet points, right? Uh, but not really the full picture behind it. And right. it's helpful when... Uh, on a staff level or a church ministry level when, when they can understand the heart and the reasoning behind it. I think that's really good. What else? 
I would just give one final thought today, and I know this is simple as we talk about our response to this day of delusion. I just want to say, pastor friends, don't quit. Um, you know, I mean, every day I hear about somebody, just yesterday, someone said, I'm going to move to Idaho. And it's so funny because Boise is becoming one of the most liberal cities in the country. Uh, their United Methodist Church uh, is, you know, very, very liberal. And, and uh, But people get in their mind that, you know, it's better somewhere else. And I just want to say that we need to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding the work of the Lord. Will God move some people around sometimes? Of course. But if we think the answer to the delusion that's going on in this country is found in moving somewhere, we're truly under a delusion. <laughs> because the problems in this nation uh, are truly spiritually systemic in the sense that there is uh, a spirit of rebellion that is from the highest levels of government to the, to the folks that are just coming into the country. There's an anti-God sentiment. And, and, and I will say this to, to all of us in leadership. Our role really hasn't changed. In other words, what am I going to do today and tomorrow? Same thing I was doing a year or two ago. Pray, read my Bible, study, try to witness for Christ, preach the word. But the wisdom that's needed now is so much different. So I would say, don't quit. And uh, don't let this be the time that, because I've had some people say, that's it. I can't handle it. And they'll name their state, whether it's California, New York, whatever. Um, but a lot of that comes back to just properly responding and growing in grace. That's awesome. You had a list you wanted to end with. Do you I want did. to run through these quickly? I do. Um, th this is something, Larry, that I, I read years ago. And I don't know if I heard this originally, maybe from John Maxwell or someone. I'm not sure who originally wrote this, but uh, I'm going to share it with you. And if you and I get a blessing, that's great if others do. But it's called The, the Gospel Commandments of Leadership. Mm -hmm. And it may have been done originally by an attorney that was a Christian attorney. Uh, but these points are excellent. I'll just read them through. And, and uh, if you want to jot them down, uh, certainly uh, you can as well as you're uh, with us today. So here you go. Number one. People are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered. Love people anyways, okay? Uh, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Number two, if you do good, people will accuse you of selfish and ulterior motives. Do good anyways. And uh, I love that as well. Uh, number three, if you are successful, you will win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyways. And uh, we saw that with our Lord. Uh, he was uh, so hated on the cross of Calvary, and yet that's where our victory was won. Uh, number four, the service you render today will be forgotten tomorrow. Serve people anyways, right? And uh, I, th I think that's a great thought. Number five, honesty and frankness will make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyways. I think that's an area where we as pastors sometimes struggle just to say, hey, I'm not 100% sure where I'm at. I'm trying to learn on this. Uh, pray for me. You know, what would you say? Just being vulnerable. And we need to be honest and frank along the way. Number six, the biggest men with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest men with the smallest ideas. Think big anyways, right? And we live in a day when someone can spend their whole life doing a good work for the Lord and some other guy sitting in his mother's basement eating Cheerios can knock him down and say how stupid he is. But you just have to keep on thinking big and dreaming big anyways. Number seven, people pretend to love the little people but sell their souls to the big people. Fight for the little people anyways. Jesus said, suffer the children to come unto me. And I think we need to keep our focus again on just serving others. And uh, that's a great help. Number eight. What you spend uh, years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyways. Um, you know, you, you look at the rearrangement of ministry right now. Uh, most churches that are starting back to services, half the people are coming. Every pastor I know is wondering, how many of them are going to come back when this is all over? You know, you spent your whole life to build something. What if there's a second wave? <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly. Oh, build anyway. Yeah. Uh, and it seems like some people want that to come. So what do you do? You just keep building. You just keep doing what God's called you to do. And leave the result to him. Number nine, people really need help, but may attack you if you do help. Help people anyways. There was a pastor evangelist named B.R. Lakin, and he used to say, well, why does he hate me so much? I never helped him. Or, you know, uh, or, or why does he hate me so much? All I did was ever help him. And, uh, and it seems like a lot of times 
uh, the people you help the most resent you the most. Mm-hmm. But but we've got to, as leaders, just keep helping people. You know, just keep encouraging people. And then number ten, uh, give the world the best you have, and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have, anyways. And uh, I think about again Jesus, and what do the people say? Give us Barabbas, you know. And so uh, you know, these are some of the ten commandments of leadership. And I just believe, as leaders, in this day of delusion, we cannot expect people to be our source of encouragement or uh, you know, uh, help along the way. I'm speaking of society. Thank the Lord for faithful Christians in the church. But we've got to stay focused on the Lord, building anyways, loving anyways, serving anyways. And if, if people once in a while say thank you or are appreciative, that's great. But when we are in a society like we're in right now, the general appetite is unthankfulness. And God said that in 1 Timothy 3, you know, and that, that there would be this, this spirit. And so we've got to go forward and not quit. I think that was a timely and helpful lesson. If that was an encouragement to you, would you let us know? And one of the ways that you can help us is by uh, making sure that you're subscribed to this podcast wherever, wherever you're watching or listening. If you could just give us a rating or share this with some of your ministry leaders, uh, we would want this to be a help to them as well. So we thank you for joining us today for this Spiritual Leadership Podcast. Have a great day. If there's a question or topic you would like Pastor Chapel to address in future episodes, send an email to qa at lancasterbaptist.org.